So tell me how this project uh, came to be. I know there, it's based on a book. Uh, what made you interested in, in turning into a film, and how did Jessica become involved? Mm, yeah, like um, most of the world, I had never heard the story of uh, Antonina Zabinska uh, or her place in history, and, and I'm ashamed to say I hadn't read the book. Um, I, I came aware of it because of the screenplay, a wonderful screenplay by Angela Workman. This is about 10 years ago, and um, Jessica was everybody's first choice to play Antonina, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. And Jessica, why did you want to play this role? I, um, when the script came to me, Zero Dark Thirty had just come out, and I had said to my agents, I said, when they asked me, you know, what, what, what would you be interested in? I said, I would love a Gorillas in the Mist. <laughs> <laughs> And, and this showed up, um, and I was so happy it did. And then also I was very excited to learn that Nikki Caro uh, was directing. And we had a very civilized tea in Italy. It was super fancy. <laughs> and um, it was the quickest yes on to a project. But, of course, it took a long time for it to get made. But I, I'm very happy to be involved. And how did you prepare to both make the film and, and to play the role? How much research were you able to do with family members and actually going to the sites uh, where these things took place? Well, I'm, I love research. I'm, and um, so I started with the novel, which is based on uh, Antonina's journals. So it's great. You really get a sense of who she was. Then I went to the Warsaw Zoo and met, which is still standing, and the house is still there in the basement where they hid everyone. Everything's intact. Um, the piano is there that she played. The bug collection is there. It's... It's crazy. Um, and I met with Teresa um, uh, Zabinska, who's the daughter of Antonina. And it was fascinating to meet with her because I could ask her questions. I said, I want to know the things that aren't in the book. So if your mother was an animal, what kind of animal would she be? <laughs> and she said, a cat. <laughs> and the reason why Antonina, the nickname was Punya, is it means little cat. So, and she also told me her mother never wore pants. Um, and she liked nail polish, but um, Jan didn't love it, so she used it very sparingly. But I understood this um, femininity um, from Teresa about you know her vision of her mother that really changed my whole, both of our whole idea of Antony. Now, how does someone take care of animals and not wear pants? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the answer is boots. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. That's a good answer. Uh, Nikki, uh, I read that you said you didn't want to make a war movie, and yet there's there are scenes of war in here. Um, how did you approach uh, shooting the? It's it's really a diverse story. I mean, you have scenes that are very intimate. You have scenes that are epic. Uh, how did you prepare for that challenge? Um, yeah, m making a, a war movie or specifically a Holocaust movie w wasn't anything I was yearning to do, um, because very good films have been made about that period of time and I didn't know how I could make a meaningful contribution. Um, but then this story came along and I could see a way of, of telling this war story that was uniquely feminine uh, about a woman who shows us that it is possible to be both soft and strong and uh, I loved I loved applying that principle to all of the filmmaking in every department. Um, we were working with femininity. And then on the weekends, on my days off, I would go and work with the second unit and blow shit up, <laughs> which was also really fun, I have to say. <laughs> and what's also really interesting is the machine that blows the shit up is actually, in the Czech Republic anyway, is actually called the Pyro Funk Controller, ah. which sounds like a Bootsy Collins album. Yeah, I just yeah. loved every second of it. <laughs> and there were quite a few women working on the film as well. I mean, obviously yeah, the Yeah, Rachel, are you here? Aha, uh -huh, there's our yeah. V camera operator. Oh, Did, did that change the energy on the set at all, to have so many women in charge, or...? Um, it didn't for me, um, because I'm quite used to it. 
but Jessica, uh, what, what surprised me actually when Jessica wrote the article in, um, in The Hollywood Reporter was that she wasn't used to it. I, I had no idea. I'm never on anybody else's film set, so I don't actually know how they do it. Um, but you should talk about that. Yeah, it's, it was one of the best experiences of my life. And it wasn't even a 50-50, it wasn't like 50% women and 50% and men. There were maybe 20% women on the set. But for the first time on a film set, it was like I wasn't one of five girls out of 100 guys. And there was balance. And the guys were really happy. <laughs> and the girls were happy. It was a great set to be on. <laughs> And what was it like working with the animals? I know some of them were had to be done with green screen, but a lot of them were really there with you. Did you have a, a favorite animal to work with? I love Lil, uh, the elephant. Um, his name was Lily, is Lily, who plays Kasha. Uh, and I, I really liked her because she had such a good sense of humor. And she just would, you know, the very first time we met, she kind of like wrapped her trunk around me. I spent a lot of time with the animals before um, we were on set. So before they were ever, you know, we were being filmed or anything, I just wanted them to get used to me and, and to know that they would be safe when I was there and to trust me. And the first time I met her, there was a little, like, string separating us, and she was looking for leaves, and I was looking for leaves for her and handing them to her. And she wrapped her trunk around me, and I thought, oh, it's so incredible. It's my gorillas are the best. It's my, you know. <laughs> and then she, like closed her trunk on my arm and then started like pulling me <laughs> towards her. And I realized she, she just always wanted to play. Um, when we were filmed that animal birth scene, I had hid apples all around me because she loved apples. And the first take, she wasn't very interested in what I was doing. But then when there were apples that she was looking for, that trunk all over me covered in elephant mucus and <laughs> dirt, um, it was it was a game, so I had a, I had a great time. Uh, they always say you'd never work with animals and children, and yet you work with both <laughs> in this movie. Uh, what was that like for you, Nikki, as the director? I mean, you're directing uh, not adult human beings a lot of the time. Yeah, I prefer it actually um, a lot of the time. Um, they're they're absolutely themselves, children and animals, and babies. Um, so the trick is you don't direct them you create the, an atmosphere where they feel absolutely safe and comfortable and you allow them to be themselves. And, and the great gift to this movie was Jessica, who was able to work with them in a way I, I'm, I'm convinced no other actress could have played this role. And the reason we could achieve the things that we did was because of her connection to the animals and theirs to her in this quite spooky, otherworldly way. I never felt that she was ever in danger. I always felt that she was, it's not like being in control, but it's being um, comfortable, relaxed, confident. Um, just, just amazing, an amazing gift to this movie. How did you like working with the children, Jessica? I love, I mean, I'm the same way. They say, t tell actors don't work with animals and children. I pref I want to all the time. Because an, as an actor, um, when you're working with an animal, they're so authentic. And you're working with a child, the baby, if the baby cries, there's you can't tell it, okay, that's not right for the scene, you know? <laughs> um, so you just, you really, ha it teaches you to just be open to your scene partner and be present. And there are some actors that are like animals, and I love working with them. <laughs> Michael Shannon, trust me. <laughs> Amazing, because you don't know what he's going to do. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, I love it. But I also I want to tell you guys that in addition to like creating a safe, open space for the animals to feel like they could do anything, if you ever have an opportunity to work with Nikki Caro, run <laughs> to work with her. So because please. <laughs> She doesn't put marks on the floor. She creates a space for you to explore. Like in Antonina's bedroom, she let me put Antonina's actual clothing in the drawers, <laughs> in the scenes and stuff. I mean, she really helped um, create a safe place for everyone to be creative. And so yes, run to work with her if you have the opportunity.
The thing I remember about that bedroom um, was that the art department, God love them, cared so much about creating this very real environment for the performers that they, they waxed the floor with orange oil so it smelt like orange blossoms. It didn't smell like stinky old grips. It actually smelt like your bedroom should have smelt and maybe a little bit animally. <laughs> And Jessica, you had many challenges in this film. Uh, you had to learn the accent. You also had to learn how to play the piano. Uh, <laughs> how did you manage that? Uh, I guess when you're finding the character, it just comes. I mean, both of those things, the piano and the accent, is a way that Antonina communicates to the world. The piano, she speaks through it because it's her signal as to, to hide or to come upstairs, you're safe or to go through the tunnel and escape. Um, the piano for her was her language. And then also in terms of the accent, um, in my research I had realized Antonina was born in St. Petersburg, grew up, grew up there and fled violence. Her parents were shot. And so she had a very difficult upbringing. And when she came to Warsaw as a young woman, she created this sanctuary and this place of healing and loving and this gift that she has with animals. Um, and so for me, it was important that Antonina sound like a refugee, sound like someone that wasn't of the place, some, someone that um, had fled something. And so in the, maybe there's some pauses or the way she thinks about the words before she says it. Uh, and, and also then the, I worked with Joan Washington on the Polish accents with the hint of her past, Russia. And then also I pitched the voice higher um, in honor of what Teresa told me about the femininity of her mom. And uh, it's an amazing ensemble. Uh, I wanted to ask about Johan Heldenberg. Um, he's wonderful as the zookeeper. Um, he was in a film called The Broken Circle Breakdown, which is a wonderful movie if anyone hasn't seen it. But I, I heard that you kind of had to fight to get him cast in the role because he's not kind of a name in Hollywood. Why was it so important to you to, to get him for that role? Mm. Well, it's always important to get the right person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but we were under a significant amount of pressure to hire actually not one but two uh, name actors for uh, Jan and Heck. And Jessica calls me one day and she says, you know, I think we should, I think we should cast um, Johan Heldenberg. And I said, oh. <laughs> um, and she directed me to the Broken Circle Breakdown and I will never be the same. And by the way, he wrote it. Um, he's incredible. And so he came and I met him and just knew he would be perfect. But he was so, see, we can talk about him because he's not here. Um, <laughs> He was so unconfident. He was absolutely convinced he was going to be fired. I don't know why, but we were always very nice to him, weren't we? I thought we were very loving. Um, but he was the camera's here stay, convinced. Week one, really convinced. It wasn't until we shot, um, you went to Toronto and we shot just with Johan in the ghetto and sort of had to rehabilitate him a little bit from bring him back from the brink. But he's so wonderful. He's like, for me, he's like an old school movie star. You know, he's so masculine. He's really tall, um, but emotionally totally open. Totally. Yeah. And then Daniel Bruhl. Um I would assume you would want to keep your distance from him on the set because your character is repulsed by him, but I read that you guys actually would joke around a lot between takes. Yeah, you would assume wrong. <laughs> He's so funny. Really? Yes, and in working on something like this, it's wonderful to have someone who can dissipate the energy in between takes, and he taught me the most, like, German curse words, like, terrible things. <laughs> which I loved. And also, I, kn I knew he was going to be fun and a little bit of trouble during the camera test when <laughs> Johan was just so, like, nervous, but not telling anyone he was nervous. And, and I was standing there, and then Johan came in, and then Daniel walked in in his uniform, and he looked at Johan, and he goes, ah, it's the pig farmer of Warsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and then Johan, like, immediately freaked out. <laughs> And there was a dynamic in that. We, we all just had so much fun. On, we were in Prague, and we went to dinners and dancing at the disco, and we, we had a good time. 
Uh, Jessica, I wanted to ask you, because we're in the Robin Williams Center here, I know you have a special connection to Robin uh, at Juilliard. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yes, well, um, Robin Williams um, gave me a scholarship that paid for um, my college education. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and he was, he was a ge very generous man who um, gave so much and, and never wanted to be acknowledged for how much he gave. I mean, every two years, he, they chose a student at, at Juilliard that they would um, bestow this gift on. And it made it possible. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. So it really changed my life. But you, you didn't get the chance to meet him in life, right? I didn't. I never got the chance to meet him. I wrote him um, letters and to thank him. And then the, the most odd thing is, and this is like, you know, whenever you have an opportunity in front of you, jump towards it. I was in Los Angeles after I graduated, and I had a meeting with some director, and we were sitting at a restaurant, and I was telling this story about Robin Williams. <laughs> and then Robin Williams came into the restaurant in the middle of my story, and then he looked at me, he's like, well, you have to say hello to him. And I said, okay, okay, but I'm very shy, and I didn't want to interrupt his meal because he came and sat down and the food had already been ordered. So I said, when he's not eating, I'm gonna go over and say hello. And before they cleared the plates, he jumped up and ran out like he was late for something. And so I like stood up in the restaurant like I was gonna chase after him. And then I went, mm, I don't, I don't wanna make him uncomfortable and I don't wanna scare him. So I didn't do it, I just I assumed that I would have another opportunity to thank him in person and I shouldn't have. Um, so that's a, a, a big heartbreak for me that I, I never had that. And since this is for the SAG After Foundation, uh, do you remember what role got you your SAG card? ER, like nice. thousands of other <laughs> <laughs> actors. Yeah, I, was, uh, I played a psychotic 17-year-old girl who was keeping her comatose father alive so she could abuse him because he had sexually abused her when she was a child. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Light stuff. That's intense. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you know you wanted to be an actress? Have you always known that's what you were going to do? My grandmother took me to a play when I was seven years old, and it was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat at the Magic Tent or whatever it was in Sacramento. And she said um, to us, uh, this is a professional play. This is, you know, this is a big deal because it was a special treat for us. You know, the, this is their job. And I was like, okay. And we went in, and the lights turned off, and there was a little girl on stage, with, like as a narrator or something. I don't even remember the musical. And as soon as I saw that, I just immediately went, ah, that's what I am. It was not like, oh, I want to be this when I grow up. It was just like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I am. Um, so it's, it was a very easy um, finding. And I'm, I'm so thankful for my grandmother for um, exposing me to the arts. And the arts are very important in our society and should not be cut. Yes, yes, yes. Well, speaking of which, I mean, this film is a period piece, but it seems like it has a lot of relevance today as well. Um, in what ways do you think it still has uh, reflection <laughs> on read our the, current read situation? Read the Washington Post. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we were making a period drama. That's what we were developing. And 18 months ago, when we were shooting at the... Uh, the migrant crisis was all around us. We were shooting in Central Europe. And I did a, a EPK thing there, and I, I said, it's happening. It's, it's happening now. And... Uh, even then, I could never have predicted that the events of 2017 would so closely mirror the events of Poland in the late 1930s. It's horrifying. Um, but it means that this is uh, now a, quite a contemporary and I hope relevant film. I hope also for a younger audience. I, you know, it's been very interesting to me that um, overwhelmingly so far, and as much as we have screened the film, uh, the story really speaks to millennials. And I'm very happy about that because they're inheriting a disaster and it's going to be up to them ultimately to, to change it. Yeah, one of the many things that I love about the movie is that it ends on a hopeful note. Um, 
how important was that to you to mm. that it not be kind of uh, mm. yeah this is the difference with this story um, that its focus is ultimately on healing and on humanity yeah questions from the audience. We only have a few <laughs> moments left, but I want to make sure to get to them. Um, Carolina asks to Jessica, what training did you do after Juilliard to keep your instrument in shape, i.e. scene study, voice work, etc.? And what of that training did you find most important for you? Uh, when I left school, I saw um, a lot of people, it was depressing. <laughs> because we left um, a place where there was always work <laughs> and always things to work on and, and parts to play. And, um, and then all of a sudden we're out in the industry and no one cared in Los Angeles that I went to Juilliard or that I'd worked on Romeo and Juliet and it wasn't something that was important to them. And I noticed a lot of people just kind of fall into that depression and just wait for the phone call to say, okay, here's your audition or here's this. And I knew that I had to keep being active. And so I created, I loved going to school. And I, for the same reason I love research and I love working on each role, I just like learning about people and I like learning. And so I created like a, a master's program for myself. Didn't get my degree. But um, I like every morning I went to a movement class whatever that was, there was a donation basis yoga class in Santa Monica. I would go to the library and I would work in the library. And, you know, I was adapting Hamlet as a movie for myself. <laughs> things, things like that that were keeping my brain and my creativity flowing. Uh, I had a great teacher once that, that said to me, At, luck will find anyone, but it doesn't mean anything if you're not prepared. <laughs> for when that moment hits you. I mean, um, Mark Ruffalo, I think, tended bar for 19 years before he got that audition. I was, you know, I was in a very good place when I got the audition to, for Salome with Al Pacino. And if I had spent those four years before just feeling sorry for myself and watching television and not really continuing my creativity, I, I would not, I don't think I would have been cast in that play. And the last question is for both of you, from Lily and Anne. Uh, what is a learning takeaway that you had about yourself or life from this film? <laughs> That's a hard question. Yeah. Yeah, it's super hard, actually, with this, with this sort of subject matter. Um, you have to go, if you're going to work responsibly, and we did, um, go very, very deep into what that period of time meant and what what was done to people. And uh, that that period of time where me and, and our colleagues all spent uh, with the research into the Warsaw Ghetto and really, really we didn't look at movies or anything, just documentary photographs, uh, any footage we could find from the time, and to deeply consider what that uh, is like, was like. Um, I don't know that you can be the same actually again when you, when you actually commit to, to that level of pain. Um, and so with the movie, um, I really wanted to honour the millions that lost their lives by celebrating 300 that didn't that that survived and 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 the extraordinary humanity of the Zabinskis and yeah I'm inspired by that. And uh, <laughs> Jessica, is it possible to identify the most important lesson you learned from playing Antonina? I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the best lesson I learned from Antonina was. Uh, how important it is to wait for someone to invite you into their space. Whatever, if it's an animal or another human being, um, not, not to impose or try to possess or own, but to allow someone, some, including animals, the dignity of the choice. And, um, 
And that was very profound for me as an artist and as a human being. Well, it's a wonderful movie, and thank you so much for taking the time. Nikki Caro, Jessica Chastain.